Good afternoon. I'm John Walters. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Hudson Institute. Uh, welcome to the uh, Stern Policy Center here at Hudson. We are honored to host Senator Tom Cotton, a powerful and respected leader on critical policy issues of our day, both at home and abroad. Senator Cotton serves on the Intelligence, Armed Services, and Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs Committees. He has worked on his family farm in Arkansas and advised American businesses with McKinsey and Company. He's a graduate of Harvard and Harvard Law School. He clerked in the U.S. Court of Appeals and after 9-11 volunteered for the United States Army. He is a decorated combat veteran and a ranger serving tours in both Iraq and Afghanistan. He served one term in the U.S. House of Representatives, and before and that's just before being elected to the United States Senate. I don't think you have to be a highly trained artillery officer to see a trajectory here. Today he joins us to discuss criminal justice policy, current trends, and the consequences of various reform proposals and policy alternatives to protect uh, public safety. Please join me in welcoming Senator Tom Cotton. Thank you, John, for the very kind introduction. Thank you all for the warm welcome and for your patience. This past Sunday, thousands of law enforcement officers, their families, and other supporters gathered at the Capitol to observe Peace Officers Memorial Day. Every speech given, every tribute paid, and every prayer offered was a poignant reminder. Public safety and order in our country often come at a high cost. Law and order in our communities doesn't arise spontaneously. Men are not angels, after all. Police officers put the badge on every morning, not knowing for sure that they'll come home at night to take it off. Dedicated prosecutors toil long hours in our courts. Corrections officers and other professionals do the thankless work of administering punishment and hopefully providing a path for redemption. And neighborhood watch groups and civic organizations take it upon themselves to raise standards of conduct in their communities. During this police week, I also want to take a moment to remember Deputy Sheriff Sonny Smith, one of Arkansas's own. Deputy Smith was an 11-year veteran of the Johnson County Sheriff's Office, and he also served proudly in our nation's Navy. He was killed in the line of duty last year, responding to a burglary. Deputy Smith's story is a sad reminder that preserving the peace takes vigilance. It takes hard work, and it takes sacrifice, sometimes the ultimate sacrifice. This may seem obvious to those who dedicate their lives to keeping our streets safe, but it's no longer so clear to some in these times of historically low crime. We're currently reaping the benefits of one of the great public policy achievements in modern times, a dramatic generation-long drop in crime. Violent crime is at a 40-year low. Property crime is at a 50-year low. Even more remarkably, this drop in crime followed a decades-long spike arising out of the drug epidemic of the 1980s and 1990s. That epidemic turned streets into literal battlefields, teenagers into foot soldiers, and too many citizens into casualties of the drug wars. It may seem like a distant nightmare, nightmare now, but make no mistake, 30 years ago, our cities were slowly dying. Maureen Dowd, then a young Metro reporter, described the ravages of the drug trade through the eyes of the children living amidst it. She quoted a 10-year-old girl who called her neighborhood, quote, the murdering area. Other children chimed in as well. Two days ago on the corner, they stabbed a man, said one. Another boy confided in Dowd, the raping, kicking, fighting, to death, it scares me. At the peak of New York's crisis, the city had 2,245 murders in one year. That's over six murders every single day. In Los Angeles, a city half the size of New York, there were 1,094 murders. Nor was the crisis limited to big cities. I have several family members living in Little Rock. At one point, Little Rock had the highest per capita murder rate in America, as memorialized in Gang War, Banging in Little Rock, an HBO documentary at the time. This was the context, I would add, in which Hillary Clinton warned about so-called super predators while championing her husband's crime bill, now much maligned by leniency advocates. Many people in those days doubted whether our society could turn itself around. 
Maybe Central Park would forever be a no-go zone for law-abiding citizens. Maybe women would never be able to ride the subway alone again. Maybe drug gangs would always outgun the police. These fears were understandable, but they were also wrong. We turned our society around and we made our streets safe again. But this didn't just happen by accident. It happened because of policy changes like bro broken windows policing, mandatory minimum sentences for violent criminals, three strikes laws, and other reforms. These sweeping changes to criminal justice policy were championed by scholars like Jim Wilson, elected leaders like Rudy Giuliani, and tough police like Bill Bratton. These policies helped to take our streets back. Too many people, it would seem, have forgotten these hard-learned lessons. They take our historically low crime rates for granted, acting as if safe neighborhoods are the natural state of man. They often speak and act as if criminals are victims too. This disturbing amnesia also comes with a policy agenda as ambitious as it is wrong-headed. Some members in Congress would reduce mandatory minimum sentences for drug traffickers and other violent felons, while giving liberal judges more discretion in sentencing again. Others want to prohibit employers from inqui inquiring about criminal history and job application forms. Some states have already done so. Just last month, one governor restored voting rights to more than 200,000 felons, regardless of the offense they committed or evidence of rehabilitation. And of course, a nationwide movement is afoot to stigmatize law enforcement and the proven policing strategies of the last 25 years. These policies are not merely wrong, they are dangerous. They threaten a return to the worst days of the 1990s when law-abiding citizens lived in fear of their lives. Indeed, we may be living through the leading edge of a new crime wave. Over the last two years, murders across 56 of our largest cities are up 17%. The numbers are even more shocking in some cities. In Chicago, murders jumped 70% in the first quarter of this year alone. In Las Vegas, 81%. In Long Beach, 125%. As a result, more and more Americans are worrying about the impact criminals are having on their communities. Last year, a Gallup po poll showed that 53% of Americans say they personally worry, quote, a great deal about crime and violence, a 14% jump from 2014 and the highest figure recorded by Gallup in 15 years. The ill-considered policies of criminal leniency advocates and the resulting increases in crime reflect a badly misguided mindset. Criminals are not victims. Criminals are criminals. Victims are victims. Now that may seem harsh to those who have security details and live in gated communities. From these comfortable perches, one can easily miss the silliness and the no notorious old New York Times headlines on Fox Butterfield stories. Headlines like, prison population growing although crime rate drops. It's easy, after all, to feel virtuous about being soft on crime when you live in Chappaqua or McLean or Woodside. But when you live in Osceola or Truman or Pine Bluff, working class towns in my state where crime has been increasing lately, you can't afford such woolly-headed abstractions. What's ironic is this supposedly new and enlightened way of thinking about criminal justice isn't new at all. The specious theory that responsibility for crime lies not with the criminal, but with society or the criminal justice system is, in fact, very old. In the 1960s and 1970s, many academic criminologists believed that criminals commit crimes because the criminal justice system works to, quote, label them as, quote, deviants. The policy implications of this theory were, to say the least, unorthodox. Legalize prohibited activity, reduce prison sentences, close prisons, restrain the police, and re swiftly restore all rights and privileges of citizenship upon release from prison. Sound familiar? This kind of thinking created the crime waves that got us to the point where Hillary Clinton wor worried publicly about so-called super predators. That all that's old is new again, I suppose. Now let me stipulate that many reformers have the noblest motives. They see crushing poverty, broken families, and struggling communities, and they want to help. Out of Christian charity, humanitarian fellow feeling, or even their own brushes with the law, 
they're seeking solutions, that they're looking in the wrong places. Modern sentencing law and policing techniques have reduced these social problems, not created them. Far from the source of the problems, our criminal justice system is a key part of the solution. Yes, it could be reformed here and there, but wholesale criminal leniency would not only be ineffective, it would also lead to more crime, more poverty, and more lives lost. Ultimately, the criminal leniency agenda will end up hurting the very offenders, families, and communities the reformers want to help. Let's consider this agenda in some more detail. As you probably know, there's a bill in Congress now that would sharply reduce mandatory minimums for a slew of federal crimes. Grant judges wider discretion to depart from these minimums and apply reductions retroactively so that duly convicted felons will be released early. The bill's advocates contend that we're locking up too many offenders for too long for too little, and we can't afford it anyway, and we should show more empathy toward those caught up in the criminal justice system. These arguments, put simply, are baseless. They've been proven wrong by hard facts and by history. Take a look at the facts. First, the claim that too many criminals are being jailed, that there is over-incarceration, ignores an unfortunate fact. For the vast majority of crimes, a perpetrator is never identified or arrested, let alone prosecuted, convicted, and jailed. Law enforcement is able to arrest or identify a likely perpetrator for only 19% of property crimes and 47% of violent crimes. If anything, we have an under-incarceration problem. Furthermore, the federal prison population is already declining. The Sentencing Commission has granted 32,000 felons early release from prison since 2007 because of earlier sentencing guideline revisions, with another 38,000 to be released. This has reduced the federal prison population to 196,000 inmates, down from 214,000 in 2014 and on track for its lowest level since 2005. And of this inmate population, only a fraction of a percent are imprisoned for an offense like mere drug possession. Even if you assume that these prisoners didn't plead down from a more serious offense, and believe me, most of them did, we're talking about fewer than 500 prisoners here. If these are the so-called low-level, nonviolent, first-time offenders that pro-leniency senators have in mind, why does their legislation extend to thousands of felons? Releasing a flood of these violent felons into our streets would surrender the hard-won gains of the last generation. That generation started with short sentences and soft-on-crime judges. In the last crime wave, judges had vast discretion in sentencing. This meant that drug dealers often returned to the streets just days after arrest. In fact, one police officer admitted to a reporter in 1984 that the majority of dealers he arrested would pay a $50 fine and be released within four days. He added, quote, for us it's cosmetics, cleaning the streets briefly. For the dealers, it's just the cost of doing business. Well, the cost of doing business for criminals needed to go up. Two main fa factors affecting the cost-benefit calculus of criminals are the severity and certainty of a criminal sentence. Increasing both in the 1980s contributed significantly to the massive drop in crime, as much as 35% of the drop, according to some studies. The truth is, you cannot decrease the severity and certainty of sentences without increasing crime. It's simply impossible. The bill sponsors rarely speak of this trade-off. They don't answer the concrete questions that matter to citizens and families and communities. How many more crimes will be committed because of sentencing reductions? How many more lives lost? How many lives ruined and communities at risk? Let me tell you, with a recidivism rate of 77% for released felons, the answer is a lot no matter how much we improve rehabilitation programs. Instead of answering these questions, advocates for leniency often point to admittedly large government budgets for law enforcement, courts, and corrections, to which I would respond, and after national security, what government priority is higher than law and order? Moreover, this perspe perspective is particularly short-sighted, especially for conservatives. Put aside the cost of crime to our governments, what about the cost of crime to our society? As for the claim that we should have more empathy for criminals, I won't even try to conceal my contempt for this idea. I empathize first and foremost with the victims of crime and their families. 
We ought to give criminals a shot at rehabilitation and redemption, but primarily because it's in our interest as a society, not because they deserve more empathy. Now, all that said, I don't discount the possibility of a manifestly unjust sentence, one so out of proportion to the crime that it shocks the conscience. But that's why the Anglo-American system of justice gives the pardon power to the executive. I support the use of the pardon and commutation as a precise scalpel to identify and remedy such cases. But what we should not do is use the blunt instrument of releasing thousands of felons and major drug dealers because of a handful of such cases, many spurious and hypothetical at that. I believe the criminal leniency bill in the Senate is dead in this year's Congress, and it should remain so if future versions allow for the release of violent felons from prison. I will, though, happily work with my colleagues on true criminal justice reform to ensure prisons aren't anarchic jungles that endanger the lives of both inmates and correctional officers, to promote rehabilitation and reintegration for those who seek it, and to stop the overcriminalization of private conduct under federal law. But I will continue to oppose any effort to give leniency to dangerous felons who prey on our communities. A second priority for the criminal leniency movement is the so-called Ban the Box initiative, which would prevent employers from inquiring about criminal history on job application forms. Ban the Box has a praiseworthy goal, which I share, helping offenders become productive members of society again. Aside from the small number of criminals sentenced to death or life without parole, all convicts will eventually return to society. It's in their interest and ours if they leave prison a changed man or woman, turning away from a life of crime and toward productive citizenship. But ban the box is not the right way to go about this. Let's be clear. The government dictates hiring decisions if it seeks to deprive employers of information instead of giving them more, and if it threatens severe punishment on employers for failing to do what is allegedly good for them, you can be pretty sure the government's policy is harmful and unworkable. Some companies have already removed the box from their forms. That's their decision, of course, and I applaud their intentions. But for many others, particularly smaller businesses, ban the box regulations will increase the cost of compliance and the processing of job candidates who will ultimately prove unqualified for work. And employers face greater litigation risks from lawsuits filed by unsuccessful applicants and from enforcement actions brought by state and federal authorities who presume their moral superiority to benighted employers. No doubt, ex-cons face long odds in the job market, odds that are understandably frustrating to them. But is it any less frustrating to make it to the end of a hiring process only to lose out? Because under Ban the Box regulations, that will be the outcome in the majority of cases. Ban the Box, in other words, is an attractive solution because it seems like a tidy solution, a quick fix that will allow us to declare victory and move on. But the truth is, Improving the post-prison lives of released felons requires a lot more. The policy changes we need cannot start at the point where an offender applies for a job. By that time, it's usually too late. We need to start earlier while felons are in prison. They need more educational and vocational training opportunities to develop the skills they'll need outside prison. When offenders are asked about their criminal history, they should be frank, but also proud of the plumbing skills they honed, or the GED they earned, or the bookkeeping courses that led to a training certification. And we want them to be able to point to the college kids who mentored them, or the ministers who saved their souls as job references. Here's the simple truth. It's not a job that makes an ex-con a contributing member of society. It's the skills he gained, the work ethic he's developed, and the commitment to an upright life that help him get the job in the first place. Another post-incarceration priority is the movement to automatically restore the franchise to felons upon completion of their sentences. Whether and how felons can earn back their voting rights has always been a decision left to the states, where it should remain, without federal interference. But as states are pressured to reconsider their felon voting rules, those advocating for automatic restoration of voting rights shouldn't throw around irresponsible charges that disagreement with this policy is illegitimate, un-American, or racist. The principle that felons surrender their voting rights when they commit a crime is embedded in our Constitution, after all. Unfortunately, advocates for felons like to throw around these poisonous accusations. Now, it's true 
There were felon disenfranchisement laws that deliberately targeted blacks after Reconstruction. But each of those laws has been justly struck down by the Supreme Court or amended to rid, rid them of their original racial animus. But that sad chapter in our history doesn't undermine the logic behind modern fel felon disenfranchisement laws. Should murderers, rapists, and others who, whose behavior falls so far outside the norms of civilized society be immediately accommodated? Given recidivism rates, rates should we create an automatic pro-crime constituency in our society? Should felons be trusted to elect legislators who make the law, prosecutors who enforce it, and judges who apply it. As with many charges of racism, we ought to reject the heated rhetoric and instead acknowledge the realities. In this case, the costs associated with the immediate restoration of voting rights to felons. An offender who automatically obtains the franchise will have little reason to buy back into the social contract and no motivation to relearn the responsibilities of citizenship. I personally believe most felons should ultimately be eligible for restoration of their voting rights. But a much better approach is to provide felons with a roadmap of rehabilitation. After relatively modest periods of demonstrated obedience to the law and lawful employment, for instance, states could reinstate voting rights upon individual application by a felon. This approach would be far preferable to immediate automatic restoration, especially when ordered by erstwhile political operatives for the electoral benefit of their political paymasters. Finally, I want to turn to policing techniques and the growing assault on law enforcement. In the past two years, our country has seen several high-profile use of force incidents. The shooting of Michael Brown, the suffocation of Eric Garner, and the death of Freddie Gray, among others. I've spoken with police officers about these incidents, and I can report that they feel abusive cops, about abusive cops the way most soldiers feel about misconduct in the ranks. They're among the first who wish to see them disciplined. And if there are systemic problems in certain districts, it's the law-abiding police departments that wish to see them reformed and quickly. That's why full investigations of use of force incidents should occur and all facts must be considered. That's why the Department of Justice is collecting reliable national data on use of force incidents for use in developing training and protocols to help officers distinguish and handle situations involving the mentally ill, the substance addled, and the truly threatening. After all, no officer wants to be involved in a justified use of force proven unnecessary after the fact. Any more than soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan wanted to make what proved to be the wrong decision in a shoot-don't-shoot shoot situation. Those decisions, even if justified, live with you forever, believe me. But what should not occur and what cannot occur is the rush to demonize law enforcement whenever force is used. In the absence of facts and hard data, we're vulnerable to heart-wrenching images, to our own biases, and to cheap demagoguery. This is dangerous. We've already seen one retaliatory attack fueled by misguided rage. In New York, a gunman claiming to seek revenge for Ferguson ambushed and killed officers Rafael Ramos and Wen Jin Liu. At a broader level, anti-law enforcement sentiment is fueling a movement to roll back vigilant policing methods the very techniques that are responsible for the historic drop in crime since the 1980s. In the very city where these methods originated, New York, there's an ideological mayor who campaigned against these policing methods and pointed to New York City's finest as part of the problem rather than the solution. No wonder they turned their backs on him. I would too. This anti-cop sentiment is surely driving the so-called Ferguson effect, as FBI Director Jim Comey has called it. When professional protesters stigmatize the police as racist knuckle-draggers, when their vigorous enforcement of the law is constantly and unfairly criticized and undermined, the chilling effect on policing is nearly unavoidable. And the result is the disturbing increases in violent crime of the last two years. President Obama and others in the criminal leniency movement are in denial about this. But it's something more and more criminologists and law enforcement officials are confirming. Now, let me make something clear. Black lives do matter. The lives being lost to violence in America's cities are predominantly those of young black men with devastating consequences for their families and their communities. But the police are not the culprits. In nearly every case, the blood is on the hands of criminals, drug dealers, and gang members. Bill Clinton recently exclaimed to protesters, 
You are defending the people who killed the lives you say matter. For once, he was right. And it's the police who are trying to protect those lives and prevent those murders. We shouldn't stigmatize them. We should thank them. And that's what most people do. What critics of vigilant policing miss is that communities, including minority communities, overwhelmingly approve of broken windows tactics. They want low-level crime stopped. They want street corners cleared at late morning hours so that their school kids don't have to walk among used needles and the lingering smell of urine and marijuana. They want safe neighborhoods. In northeast Arkansas, there's a town called Blyville. Blyville's faced some tough times. Its population has fallen by 40%, especially since the Air Force Base closed. Blyville is also majority African American. It's faced a serious crime and drug problem. Last year, in a major operation, hundreds of FBI agents raided the town in the dead of night to arrest 70 drug dealers. What was the reaction in the community? It wasn't anguish. It wasn't fear. It wasn't indignation that law enforcement used aggressive tactics. The reaction was unalloyed gratitude. One woman ran up to the FBI agent. She cried tears of joy. The operation, she said, was the answer to her prayers. There's another Blavo resident, a woman named Vivian Harrison. Two years ago, her son Justin was shot and killed in a senseless murder. She awoke the day of the FBI raid, and she praised it. She said she'd like to see the town rid of crime to the point where, quote, decent, hardworking people can go on with their lives without being in fear. I'll conclude with what I wish were a joke, but unfortunately it's not. The Obama administration has become so solicitous towards criminals that we're now not supposed to call them criminals at all. Now the new term is justice-involved individual. Not joking. This is the administration's new term for criminals, justice-involved individual. That alone is a crime against the English language. But it's much worse. It reflects the dangerous mindset that criminals are victims, that the justice system somehow happened to them. They didn't commit a crime. They became involved in the justice system. Let me say again. Criminals are not victims. Criminals are criminals. Victims are victims. When we talk about crime and justice, we should never forget the actual victims of crime. People like Vivian Harrison, her murdered son, and other residents of places like Blyville. These are the people I have in mind when we make criminal justice policy. So pardon me if I err on the side of being a little too tough on crime rather than a little too soft on crime. It's only innocent lives hanging in the balance after all. For their sake, we ought not make radical changes to a justice system that has delivered so much hope to so many communities since the crime wave of the last generation. We ought not discard proven strategies for political fashions, and we ought not care for criminals more than we care for victims and their families and communities. Thank you. Time for questions. Time for this. We're, we're good. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think the uh, point about the legislation now pending before Congress is important, and I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit more on why you think the, the uh, reform uh, measure is dead. Well, it's deeply divided, divisive within the Senate uh, and the House as well, in part because there's a large number of senators and congressmen who don't think criminals are victims. They think criminals are criminals. And they look at the facts. And the facts of the matter are that well under 1,000 people are in federal prison today because of anything like mere possession. And most of those pleaded down, trust me. Um, yet this bill would extend to thousands of criminals who are in prison today. We've already seen violent crime happen from felons released early under those previous uh, sentencing guideline revisions by the Sentencing Commission. And not many senators or congressmen want to be responsible for the murder or the rape of innocent, uh, innocent civilians out on the street. You'll probably see more of that with the tens of thousands that are slated already to be released in the next Like year. I said, they've already happened. Wendell Callahan in Ohio murdered his ex-girlfriend and her two young children. And there's, gonna, there's still more, more prisoners left to be released than, than have been released. And it's just a simple fact. When recidivism rates are at 77 percent, you can count on violent crime happening when you release tens of thousands of prisoners from prison. Because remember, that's all in, in the federal prison system, we are only talking about a few hundred prisoners at most. 
I can't account for what every single state does. I know what Arkansas does that's largely consistent with what I would suggest that we do with true low-level nonviolent offenders, you know, kids who get involved in pranks that go awry or people who just, you know, smoke one joint. Um, that's largely a state matter, but in the federal prison system, almost everyone there is in prison because they were a violent felon or they are a repeat felon. This may not be the only policy area where there's such a uh, disjunction between the reality and uh, and even experience within the lifetime of people like the Clintons and those of us who worked on some of these issues in the past. Um, do you have any advice? On, this is one of those cases where it doesn't seem that facts matter. It doesn't seem that uh, uh, history matters. It doesn't seem that um, uh, unfortunate harm to innocent Americans matter. What what happens to political debate in this time, and how do you get a kind of reestablishment on some ground of common sense and, and reality? Well, facts are increasingly mattering. As I, as I mentioned, violent crime has increased over the last two years. Um, in some cities, it's more than doubled. Uh, and Gallup has shown that the American people are more concerned about crime now than they have been in the last 15 years, and that gets the attention of politicians pretty quickly. There's a reason that bill has stalled in the Senate. There's a reason the House has not acted, and that's because increasingly senators and representatives are, are hearing from the voters they've served back home. Uh, that's especially true on the Republican side. I mean, I, I don't know of any single Republican senator in his, last, his or her last campaign who campaigned for letting felons out of prison. So there's hope on the side of reality and common sense here. Well, as I said, I don't think the bill will move forward uh, this year. There are other areas where we could reform our criminal justice system. John Cornyn has some important provisions about prison reform. Kelly Ayotte and Rob Portman have some important measures that would promote greater rehabilitation in prison, which is where it should be occurring. Um, Orrin Hatch, John, uh, or uh, Bob Goodlad have worked on um, provisions that would stop the overcriminalization of private conduct. That's where our efforts should be focused, not allowing violent felons to get out of jail. I mean, again, there are only a few hundred at most, nonviolent, low-level offenders in prison. I mean, I, I, in the Army and business, I worked with spreadsheets that were much larger than that. Why can't the advocates for this bill, why can't the Obama administration produce a spreadsheet that has the names of all the felons that would be released under this bill? It shouldn't be that hard. And if you can do that, why can't he use the pardon power? You know, they always cite Weldon Angelos uh, as the um, uh, example of why we need criminal justice reform. This is a gentleman who was arrested for multiple drug offenses, and because of the way provisions are stacked, uh, got decades in prison. Whatever you think about his individual case, if Barack Obama is going to hold him up as the example for criminal justice reform, why has he not pardoned him yet? It's because he cares more about using that man as a political prop to advance his agenda than he does care about doing justice for him. Many of the people who worked on, on the issue of crime, especially uh, crime and, um, and, uh, and race, uh, point to some of the things you alluded to, that the victims of crime are similar in demographics to the perpetrators in many communities, that uh, people harm people who they live with, uh, more males than females, but in terms of race and, and neighborhood association. Um, one question I think that, that, that is frequently raised here is, is what happens in poor neighborhoods? What happens and shouldn't we do more with regard especially to young black men in our in our cities with regard to education and the kind of uh, uh, environment that leads many of them to become self-destructive and other destructive? It, that seems to not have been much of a part of the debate either by the administration or in this crime bill, but it does seem to be something that tradition and history shows is underneath and necessarily bound up with it. Well, I mean, there's no doubt that, you know, we failed an entire generation um, of young children, for instance, through our public school systems um, that are utter, utter failures that have not given them the knowledge they need to be good citizens or the skills they need uh, to be productive citizens in our economy. And, and that's certainly something where especially state and local government should work much harder. But the solution to that hard problem is not to let out a bunch of violent felons or not to reduce sentences for violent felons because all you're doing is making it harder for a community to thrive if they have that level of crime on their streets. You know, I saw this in Baghdad. We saw, we've seen it again in Afghanistan. Security has to come first, whether you're in a war zone or whether you're in the United States of America. Without law and order, without safety and security on the streets, there can be no other flourishing of human activity. Can you say a little bit about um, uh, 
the, the part of the criminal justice system that has involved also non-citizens. One of the things that's striking, you mentioned uh, drug dealers and others. In the federal system, um, various estimates of the people that might be covered by this bill have as many as a third of them would be non-citizens because of the federal jurisdiction and especially drug crime and other kinds of crime. Um, that seems to be a dimension that is big but not really the argument that you hear about, well, there's too many Americans being charged for low-level offenses. Uh, that the, on the one hand, the bill is being, being presented as saving the victim of uh, excessive enforcement. On the other hand, the people being let out are people who are uh, actively working to harm Americans and aren't Americans. Has that been a factor in the discussion? And it seems well, to have not been prominent yeah, in the debate. The, the, maybe the only issue in which elites in places like McLean and Chappaqua and Woodside are more out of touch with normal Americans than criminal justice is our immigration system. Um, by and large, immigrants who come here uh, are hardworking people. They want to take their shot at the American dream, give their kids a better chance. But because of the nature of the drug trade, because of the nature of human trafficking, there are a large number of foreigners who are in our prison systems today. And some of them would be let out on this legislation. And we should not be letting them out any more than we should let out American citizens. And when they ultimately do get out, they should not stay here. They should go back to their home country. That's not been a, the typical uh, result. I've noticed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, uh, it's, is, is this a matter, is this a matter of, of, of standing up for what's right, or do you think there's a way to kind of educate uh, that we, I mean, we're here in a think tank. Part of our job is to help people understand policy and recommend policy options. Is there a way to better work with both members of the Congress and also uh, American people to try to, or is it, as you said, look, they're going to be watching, the Americans are going to watch the 11 o'clock news and they're going to see this is stupid and getting worse. And that's going to be the education. Well, uh, I mean, I, by and large, I, I think the uh, pro-leniency advocates heart is in the right place. They're trying to solve some of the problems that we were discussing earlier about poverty um, or lack of opportunity. There are some that are seeking electoral gain, such as uh, the governor across the river. But uh, by and large, their heart is in the right place. I think the facts are simply not on their side. And oftentimes, in public policy debates, the, the actual real-life practical impact on innocent victims uh, can make a bigger impression than the facts. The story of places like Blyville or women like Vivian Harrison. That's one reason why I try to keep the focus on the victims of crime. You know, these violent felons that we have in federal prison didn't commit victimless crimes. Even if they're not violent felons, they didn't commit victimless crimes because they maybe stole you know, a senior citizen couple's retirement, for instance. Um, but our, in my opinion, our first and foremost focus should be on the victims of those crimes. And it's the victims and their stories which helped contribute in the late 1980s and the 1990s to the radical change that we saw in criminal justice policy. Also, I've been struck by how there's been little debate, and I wondered if it's just not visible to us on the outside, of mandatory minimums, in addition to, to being concerned about harshness, you referred to lenient judges. It was also seen to be a, a way of creating nationwide equity, that the, the sentencing guidelines created a, a situation where more, if you committed a crime in New York, you were going to be sentenced in the same way as if you committed the crime in Texas. Um, that seems not to be a discussion here in the, in the changing of these guidelines and loosening them, which was also a matter of uh, racial equity as well as uh, regional equity in the country. But that doesn't seem to have been part of the debate. I, I mean, there, there are a lot of unintended consequences of the proposed legislation that have not been a, a center point of the debate. But you're right that not just across, across big gaps in regions, in, say, Arkansas on the one hand, Oklahoma on the other hand, Texas on the other hand, those, all, all three of those states sit in different federal circuits. So they might have wildly different controlling legal precedents if we, were, if we invest judges with more discretion. But even within a single judicial district in the Eastern District of Arkansas or the Western District of Arkansas, judges, if they are given more discretion to sentence, are going to have differing results based on their own views, their own understanding of the law, their understanding of the case in front of them. And you are going to have more inequities in similarly situated uh, defendants. That's just the fact. We saw that in the 1980s and the 1990s. I think, a lot of, again, a lot of people have forgotten these lessons because we've enjoyed uh, 25 years of declining crime to where his, we've had historical, historically low levels. And that's allowed people to indulge in some of these woolly-headed abstractions. 
The other thing that the mandatory minimums did, of course, was to face um, people involved in conspiracies with um, serious time for the, uh, the threat that that group of people posed. And it helped to break down those conspiracies, as well as break down things like violent gangs. I mean, you talked about the example in Arkansas where, and I know that federal officials in some cases went into areas where there were grave local difficulties in managing the violence in, 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 in everything from witness intimidation to just the capacity to deal and, and, and hold violent people, uh, individuals, once they were uh, uh, arrested. That doesn't also seem to have been a part of the discussion on the Hill with repealing these yeah. tools for law enforcement. It, it hasn't, and it's unfortunate because, as you say, the sentencing reforms of the 1980s were designed to, to get kingpins more than they were street dealers. Now, a street dealer who's making a living off the drug trade and is carrying a weapon when he trades is, in my mind, a violent felon. But the person who, who's creating the real problem is the drug kingpin who controls the entire neighborhood and employs him for the street dealer four levels down, or the one who controls an entire state or section of the country that is working directly with the cartels in Latin America. I mean, those, those are the people who we really need to focus on. We can't take our focus off the street level crime, but those are the ones who are most responsible for degrading the quality of life and safety on the streets of our communities. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, um, about the attack on law enforcement. Uh, this has been a, uh, uh, a prominent feature of, uh, unfortunately, recent stories as you mentioned, seizing on some events that there, uh, are, there was misbehavior in a part of police, but then generalizing that to, um, to police officers in general. I mean, this is something we've done to other institutions of our society in the past, the military, the uh, 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 even political leadership in some cases where people have taken a courageous stand, but they've been subject to this kind of uh, uh, unjust attack. Um, you're going to have instances, as, as you know, uh, that are going to look or can be reported in an ambiguous way. Do you have any advice on kind of how we should kind of sort that out and, and do a better job to be fair to the people protecting us and at the same time uh, obviously weed out those who are, uh, wrong, who, are, who are doing wrong in the name of public trust? Um, well, you know, one thing you learn in combat um, is that first reports from the front are often or even usually wrong, um, and that can often be the case in law enforcement as well. The situations are murky, um, the facts are unknown, maybe if it's caught on videotape it appears much worse than it is. Um, in some of, that case, some of these cases that's been the case. In fact, the Obama Department of Justice has exonerated certain police officers or police departments. In other, that's not the case. And those officers have faced discipline or even criminal action uh, for their misconduct. And, and again, any time you have a, uh, the large numbers of people we have in law, inf law enforcement at every level in every state across this country, you're going to have some people to do the wrong thing. Just like in the Army, we had people to do the wrong thing. I mean, there's only 535 of us in Congress, and imagine how much we do the wrong thing. <laughs> so, so there's always going to be some small number of people who do the wrong thing. But the people who, who belong to an organization, whether it's Congress or whether it's the military or whether it's law enforcement, are usually the ones who are most protective of its reputation, who most want to defend it and make sure that it's doing the right thing, fulfilling its mission in society. And that's one reason why I think we shouldn't be stigmatizing the police. We should be thanking the police. Um, I want to ask you one last question about, about the relationship you see between the federal government and state and local officials. This has been a, uh, uh, a huge part of, uh, of reducing crime with task force as well as with law and uh, punishment. But um, part of this, this whole discussion has brought, I was uh, uh, talked to some members of Congress and brought the Sheriff's Association and some others up to the Hill to ask, you know, please don't do this. Um, um, how do you see the, uh, the, the way ahead with regard to this legislation and its link to um, um, state laws and, as well as federal laws? Because this is part of this discussion is obviously designed to go back to states and, and criticize the, the criminal justice system in those states. Um, you go back to Arkansas and talk to people there that have to carry out uh, uh, these responsibilities. Um, how do they see this kind of threat that is not just in Washington, but is a threat on the justice of uh, the American criminal justice system throughout the country? Well, well I hear regularly um, from uh, law enforcement officials, from sheriffs, from police officers, from prosecutors, from judges in Arkansas, who thank me for my work to stop this misguided sentencing bill, and for that matter, other misguided measures from the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, it's important that law enforcement officers 
back home are contacting their senator and their congressman because they have the highest degree of credibility on the issues. And again, they're the ones that care the most. They're not looking for a blank check. They're not looking to be insulated from all responsibility and accountability. They are the ones who want to uphold the highest standards in their police department or their sheriff's department or in their courtroom and so forth. So it is very important that law enforcement back home contact their senator and their congressman in Washington. Uh, and to, to take the first point you made about the importance of state, federal, uh, local state, federal cooperation. I mean, for as long as we've had a federal republic, we've had criminals who try to exploit the seams in those jurisdictions, whether it's you know, a city and un unincorporated county land in places like Arkansas, or whether it's across state lines. Um, and over the last 30 years, in addition to the changes that we've had in, you know, beat level uh, policing techniques like broken windows policing or community policing, uh, it's my understanding that we've seen much better cooperation and coordination of efforts across all three levels of our government, which really is essential, especially when you're dealing with cross states and international crimes like the drug trade. That's great. Is there anything I didn't ask you you want to add after this discussion? Because I, I know you got I have a lot I could get off my chest, but I yeah. think I'm going to have to get back for votes, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank All you right. again for being here. Thank you. Thanks,